everybody. So there's a decline in the <laughs> number of students. So it's the last three weeks, okay, but you survived this far. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see uh, who is going to survive at the end of the semester. Uh, uh, so in the I started uh, grading your fifth homeworks, but I haven't finished uh, grading yet. Um, there are different alternative solutions. If you remember, it was to find a bound on epsilon uh, for the shear transform, which is going to uh, make sure that no two points have the same x coordinate uh, without actually disrupting the original order. So I, I'm, I started grading it. Uh, there are different solutions. Uh, I'm going to talk about the alternative solutions next week, okay, after I finish the, uh, grading the whole homeworks. And the plan for the last three weeks is that uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, robot motion planning today. Uh, we, we are going to talk about the uh, terms. So what's motion planning? We are going to um, see a new problem. And we are going to make certain obstructions. Uh, it's not, I mean, the problem that we are going to be dealing with is going to be purely geometrical. And in real life, uh, in real robot motion planning, we are going to see there are other things that we need to consider. And we are going to uh, make certain assumptions. Uh, and we are not going to deal with these other problems. And so today we are going to see uh, robot motion planning. And we are going to see uh, Minkowski sums. Uh, we, we are going to see uh, these, this is a, uh, from geometry. Um, uh, and then next week we are going to talk about, uh, I mean this week the path we find, we are going to find the path for robots uh, in a 2D space uh, this uh, week. But the path we find is not going to be necessarily the shortest path. We are not going to be dealing with uh, that problem. Just find any path, which is good for us. Uh, this is the first, find the path. Okay, then uh, the next problem is we are going to talk about whether uh, is it a more efficient path exists, a shorter path exists or not. We are going to talk about this next week. In, and we are going to compute visibility graphs for that purpose. Uh, it's going to be uh, like a plane sweep algorithm, but this time we are going to sweep the plane in a rotational way. So it's going to be a rotational plane sweep, not a translational plane sweep. Uh, and the final week, uh, I chose the topic uh, three-dimensional convex hulls. So convex hulls of uh, 3D point sets uh, as the topic for the last, last week. Okay, Because the other things, the data structures, other uh, rectangular search data structures, and the BSP trees, uh, you already see them uh, in other classes. So uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how, at least in the last week, we go beyond 2D and <laughs> deal with a 3D problem. So up to now, all the semester, all our problems were in, in two space. OK, so any questions uh, before we start about the homework? I also uh, started uh, implementing the homework, and um, it's not very difficult if you uh, use uh, the hints that I gave. I mean, there's <laughs> if you use the existing algorithms in the book, it's not very difficult to implement. And uh, it's like 300 lines of code in total. I mean, if you, I mean, the template was already 150 lines, so just adding another 100 lines of code, uh, you can you can find a solution. But there are degeneracies uh, that you may need to handle. For example, when I wrote the algorithm uh, in the first uh, the sample that the I provided, uh, the sample con to test uh, case, it found it correctly. But then I tried another samples, and it didn't. It gave some errors. So uh, right now I'm trying to find a bug <laughs> where uh, I mean probably there is some degeneracy, uh, and this happens to. Uh, I mean th this makes the algorithm work, makes the algorithm not robust. Okay, um, and you can assume all the points are the in the sample, uh, or you can assume they're going to be in between 0 and 700. Okay, they're x and y coordinates. So they're in the first quadrant, and uh, the, the x and y can be at most 700. Okay, uh, but this doesn't give a bound. But, but no, 
let me just not say that. <laughs> okay, it's going to be too much. It's, it's because it's a, a, what I'm going to say was specific to a specific solution. <laughs> uh, so you may have other solutions. Okay, so I'm um, I'm not going to uh, say the, uh, the this fact about the other solution. Okay, do you, do you have any questions? Okay, so if 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 not, let's start with today's problem: robot motion planning. Okay. So, uh, the robotics is an emerging area. I mean, there are lots of people doing research in robotics, and there are different problems involved. Learning problems, uh, it's, uh, there it's computer vision related uh, things happen there. I mean, artificial intelligence related problems, computer vision related problems. And what we want, usually, uh, we want automated robots, okay? I mean, a robot is, may not, when in, in the plain sense, a robot may not be uh, automated. I mean, it's, it may, uh, you can tell uh, how the, I mean, you can control a robot. But when the field of robotics is dealing with automated robots. So, uh, for example, when, if we tell something, uh, if we tell the robot to do something, okay, go there, we don't want to deal with, uh, I mean, we want the robot to, to find itself how to go there, okay? We don't want to say to the robot how to do it. We just say to the robot what to do, okay? Just go this place. There are objectives, and we expect the robot to accomplish these objectives automatically. And one of these, the most uh, common uh, objectives, I mean, the most widely used objectives is to tell the robot to go somewhere, okay? I mean, so, so go this place, so for example, in a factory environment, uh, you, you load a, for example, uh, an automated robot, which is a vehicle, that which carries things, for example, you tell the robot, okay, now your objective is to take these packets, for example, packages, for example, to this location, you specify, your, so the robot has a starting location and you specify an ending location and you expect the robot to go there uh, automatically uh, by itself. So this is, in order for the robot to be able to do that, the robot has to do some path planning. Okay, How, so which way the robot is going, so where, where is it going to go? Uh, which path is going to follow to reach the objective? This is the problem of robot motion planning. And there are different, uh, in real life, there are different cases that uh, occurs. For example, uh, our real working environment is actually three-dimensional, okay? I mean, there may be uh, obstacles not on the floor. For example, if you just look at the floor, the floor may be empty, but there may be an obstacle. Uh, a, a certain piece, for example, may be hanging out like this, which uh, restricts the robot to go from that in, that in that place. But we are going to, in our problem today, we are going to ignore such cases and we are going to assume that we just uh, have a 2D path planning problem in which we have a floor plan of certain, we have certain obstacles in this floor plan that the robot cannot uh, go through. Uh, so the robot has to find a path uh, to itself uh, that goes between uh, these obstacles. And another thing that is in real life, what happens is that in a factory environment, uh, these obstacles may not be static. For example, there may be people walking around. So you may have a dynamic obstacle environment. So in such a case, uh, you need to have an online path planning algorithm. I mean, you need to decide things on the fly, real time. This is a much difficult problem, so the robot has to also rely on its sensors. So what is the, the knowledge that the robot has may be aesthetic. A floor plan, for example, is a static thing. But when the, the dynamic thing, when there are moving entities uh, in the environment, what you need to do is that, that knowledge, that static knowledge is not necessary, so the robot has to have cameras uh, to see what's going on uh, around him, around it. So. Uh, that is uh, that's a more difficult problem. So we are going to assume today. So these are I'm just uh, talking about the assumptions that we have in our problem today. So we assume that we are we have a 2D MR. We are going to model our working space uh, with uh, 2D uh, on, in, in 2D with polygonal obstacles. Uh, just uh, distributed randomly. I mean, not randomly. And it's, it's so the polygonal obstacles shows the floor plan of a factory, for example, or some maybe an open environment as well. 
Uh, and we assume that there are no moving obstacles. Everything is static. So the robot initially has a map and the path is path planning is done before the robot uh, starts moving. So you can plan your path uh, that's going to get you from the start to the goal uh, without touching or going through these obstacles. So this is the problem that we are going to be dealing with. Now, uh, another uh, thing is uh, you need to also make some assumptions about our robot. Okay. Uh, for example, the robot uh, is not just a point, and it's, we are not trying to find a path for a point. Our robot is going to have a certain size, okay? It's going to have a certain size, for example, if it's a... The robot is like a rectangle like this, so we, are, we should also make assumptions about how can it move. Is it a car? If it's a car-like robot, I mean with some uh, wheels here, here, uh, for example, it cannot move arbitrarily, right? I mean, it can only turn with certain angles. I mean, it can go this way, and it may make turns like this, but uh, it cannot go like this, probably. I mean, like cars, I mean, if we could go like this, parallel parking would be very easy. <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, uh, why parallel parking is hard, because our uh, movement is limited to certain uh, places. But again, we are going to assume that in this today, when we are uh, trying to uh, find a solution to this problem, we are going to assume that our robot can move, can make arbitrary translations. Okay, it's not going to be a car-like robot, it's going to be able to move arbitrarily. And there are such robots, I mean, it can be mechanically done, I mean, by rotating the uh, tires, I mean, you, you, can able, you can actually have robots that, that can move arbitrarily, in, in arbitrary uh, translations. Also, uh, the robot can rotate without actually, if this is the reference point of a robot, uh, it can rotate around this reference point with certain angles. Uh, first, we are going to just uh, look at a translational robot. Okay, we are going to ignore the rotations in the first part to find a solution. Then we are going to uh, try to see how to extend this translational assumption to also robots that can rotate. Okay, so our uh, our robot is going to be like this. Imagine your this is a long rect rectangle. Our robot is going to make uh, moves only like this. It's always going to be uh, vertical <laughs> like this, so it can go uh, these ways, but it's going to be always vertical. Our robot is not going to be like this in any, any time, okay? So a translational robot uh, is just going to, we are just going to translate uh, the, tra our, the transformation that we apply to this robot is just going to be translation. So uh, in the first part of the solution, we are going to ignore such rotations. But in, we are going to see that to find a path, uh, sometimes rotation will be necessary. Uh, for example, if you have a, like a robot, this long rectangle, uh, there may be certain passages that you cannot pass through, that, that you can pass only with certain rotations, okay? Without I mean, this is what happens, for example, when you're moving uh, to a new house, uh, when you're moving a refrigerator, for example, a big object, you need to rotate the refrigerator to move it from room to room, right? I mean, you cannot just do translation. So these rotations are necessary to get the uh, object to its uh, goal position. Okay, now let's uh, think about, now let's talk about some terminology. Uh, the robot, uh, the, our workspace is going to be a two-dimensional map like this, which is bounded by, a, I mean, this map is bounded by a rectangle like this. This is where the robot is going to move. And in this workspace, we are going to have obstacles, just arbitrary polygons. They don't need to be convex, okay? so. These are our obstacles. And we have a robot, for example, here. This is my robot. And I want the robot to go to this place. So this is start. This is 
the goal and I have obstacles. So my goal is to find the path for this robot to reach its goal position by just uh, translations. So this is my work uh, space. Now, what we are doing is this path uh, is going to be a series of configurations of the robot. So a configuration of a robot is its position uh, in this, for example, actually, uh, it's so for example, when the robot is here or here, how can you represent these two different cases? I mean, what's, what, how do you represent this? How do you represent that the robot is here in the workspace or the robot is here in the workspace? Since we are allowed only with translations, you can represent it, uh, for example, uh, if this is origin, zero, zero, this is, these are the vertices of the robot at zero, zero. Uh, any position of this robot in this workspace is going to be, uh, it's, can be, so this is my robot, can be represented by uh, two numbers, x and y, which uh, shows how much the robot is translated uh, to reach to that position. So if, for example, this is, this vertex is, for example, uh, 0, 1, and if r, 5, 6, for example, is going to be, uh, this vertex is going to be 0 plus 5 and 6 plus 1 is going to be 5, 7. Okay, so uh, this uh, configuration, this, this amount of translation will move this vertex, 0, 1 vertex, to position 5, 7. Okay, so, so somewhere here, for example. So uh, all the XY positions, all the XY trans, all the possible XY translations, uh, and we need to. I mean, if we since this robot is a rigid object, moving this vertex means moving the other vertices along with it. Okay, so we, we need to apply this translation to all the vertices of the robot. Now this is. Uh, all the possible XY values, all the possible uh, translations that we can do on the robot, so which is a, a two-dimensional search space, the, the, all the possible values X, y, X and Y can get, is called our configuration space. Okay, so our configuration space uh, is a two-dimensional two space, and a configuration uh, here, a configuration of a robot, is represented by a point XY. But it's representing. But this co in configuration space, we have a point x, y. This is our, or you can say this is solution space. Not not solution because our solutions are paths. Okay, so uh, it's a, our solution is a path in this configuration space. In the configuration space, we have all the possible values the uh, robot uh, the tr the translations can have. But a configuration actually corresponds to a positioning of the robot in the workspace. So these are, uh, so this is, uh, there is a subtle distinct, dis distinction between the configuration space and the workspace. Okay, so in the workspace, we look at the actual geometrical entity. Okay, in the workspace, we, the robot is a polygonal object. It has a certain placement in a 2D map. Okay, this is our workspace. And in configuration space, we just deal with uh, the, the configuration is represented as a point, as a re like the reference point uh, of the robot. And uh, this, the di distinction between configuration and workspace is more clear when we, also have, when we have, for example, rotational robots. In rotational robots, our configuration space is going to be uh, x, y, and a theta. Okay, theta, which, is the, which can be between 0 and 360, uh, in degrees, for example. Uh, maybe 360 and 0 is equal, so we can, we can say 0 and 359. Okay, so here, this configuration space is, looks actually more like a, the, the search, the configuration space. The search space we have is a 2D plane, uh, it's, it's three-dimensional, okay? So the XY plane and theta. And theta can only get values between 0 and 259, so actually our configuration space looks more like a cylinder, 
Okay, so it's not it, our, our search space configuration space is like a cylinder, but the in the workspace as this corresponds to a certain placement of a robot. I mean, the, the picture we are going to see in the workspace is going to be different. But uh, given any configuration, given any of these three values, you can map this configuration to the workspace because I mean, this is the goal of this. To uh, you can you can visualize where the robot is and how it looks like by, by, with the help of these uh, unique uh, configurations. Now, the, I mean, we need these terminologies because um, we are going to uh, try to next define the, the a free space and forbidden space in this configuration space. Okay, so in this configuration, as you can imagine, not all configurations are uh, allowed. <laughs> Because exerting configuration, what will happen is that the robot is going to intersect with the obstacle. So since we don't want the robot to intersect with the obstacles, in this configuration space, there will be certain parts, certain xy values, which are allowed, and certain xy values, which are not allowed. Okay? So these are called the free configuration space and forbidden configuration space. Uh, now, the, for a point robot, if our robot was a point, just a point, the configuration space and the workspace are exactly the same. <laughs> okay, so because the point, uh, if you put it in the workspace, it's going to be again a point. So the configuration space and the workspaces are the same things for a point robot. But uh, for a uh, polygonal robot, the configuration space, we have just a point. In the workspace, we have a polygon. So that's the, that's the, that's the distinction. Yes, question? Mm -hmm. R. R is robot, it's our robot. Uh, no, I mean, it's just... Um, uh, so it maps, R is like... Um, it's not like a function, it just... Uh, I mean, it, it denotes a certain configuration of the robot, okay? so. Uh, it, I mean, it, it maps the robot. I mean, for example, you, if you get R X Y, I mean, it's like an abstract function. Which I mean, when you apply R X Y on the actual robot, uh, you uh, place the robot in a, in a certain position in the workspace. So the result of this function is a placement of a robot in the workspace. Okay, so this is what. So it's it's like an action. Okay, it's not like a function, but more like an action. So R X I means that translate this robot from its original position uh, to this. And usually, like the center point can be, so this, with respect to reference point, usually this reference point is like the center of this robot, but not necessarily. It could be something like this. Uh, this is uh, zero, zero, and this is where your robot is, and this is, this configuration may be R zero, zero, okay? So, uh, but I mean, not, let's, let's not complicate things. Just assume that in R00, we have the robot here in origin. It's reference point in or it's, Let's just assume it's reference point is somewhere, at some point inside the robot. Now, so we have the configuration space and we have the uh, workspace. And usually, uh, our configuration, the dimensionality of our configuration space is also called the degrees of freedom, okay? So in, in this, a, for a, a translational robot has two degrees of freedom, okay? It can change its configuration in X and, or, and Y. So this is two degrees of freedom and a rotational robot has three degrees of freedom. And uh, for example, a translational robot uh, in three dimensions in 3D, a translational robot is going to have, again, three degrees of freedom. And a rotational robot in three dimensions is going to have six degrees of freedom because a single theta is not going to be enough to denote all the rotations in a three-dimensional space. So, for example, for planes, these have uh, special names, yaw, pitch, and roll. Uh, so, uh, I mean, these are the angles it makes with the, the three axes. So there are three different axes of rotation that you can do. And uh, what happens is that, so you need to ha have 
three, uh, you, you have additional three degrees of freedom. So a translational and rotational object uh, like this, a rigid object like this in uh, 3D space have six degrees of freedom, okay, if it can rotate and translate. Now, I have uh, talked about the forbidden space and the uh, free configuration space. Now, let's uh, see how we can compute the uh, forbidden space, okay? So, I mean, the forbidden space is determined by these uh, polygons. But uh, in order to find the path through this map, we need to again have a data structure, okay? So, uh, I mean, how do you just, if you just represented it po in, with polygons, I mean, if you can move anywhere, you need to have a, some kind of a road map which is going to tell you where to go, where to go next. In this, in this, I mean, this is just an empty configuration space that you can go free configuration space. But which points I should go next, for example? You need, we need a kind of a road map which is going to guide us, guide our robot to go uh, to, uh, step by step to different places in this map. Now, let's just first assume because uh, in order to compute uh, the forbidden space for a polygonal robot, we first need to uh, talk about the uh, uh, notion of Minkowski sums. But I'm going to uh, do it after the break. So first, let's see what happens. Uh, how can we find a path when we have a point robot? Okay, just. Just for, forget about the uh, rectangular robots for now. And imagine we have a point robot. And the main reason we consider point robot is just to first devise a solution. So it's these simpli simplifications are good uh, to first find the solution, uh, to think about a solution easier. Then you can extend your solution to buy uh, I mean, relaxing your assumptions. Now, this is our robot, and this is uh, start point, and this is uh, the goal point. Now, uh, th these are we are given in this com in this workspace. We are given a set of obstacles. Okay. Now, these obstacles are polygonal objects. They can be com and here we have uh, three of them. Okay. Now, a polygon here in this workspace, what, what I'm going to, uh, what we are going to do is, uh, in order to, since we are going to do our search where the robot is going to go in the configuration space, which yeah, X, Y is the point can have, uh, what we need is a mapping. We also need a reverse mapping from this uh, works polygon in the workspace to the configuration space. So this polygon, uh, wh what does it represent? What does it uh, uh, map to in the configuration space? I mean, to find which areas I cannot go in the configuration space, I need to map this polygon to the configuration space. And this uh, is called the configuration space obstacle. Configuration space obstacle. So this term, configuration space obstacle, is for a given obstacle, this obstacle, which uh, areas in the configuration space this obstacle forbids, OK? Now, this mapping is very trivial for a point like robot, because this polygon is exactly going to be the same polygon in the configuration space. But for a translation robot, this polygon is not going to be the same, OK? Because uh, here, a polygon, for example, when our, if it was a polygonal robot, okay, this point, its reference point, although does not intersect with this polygon, the robot itself intersects with the polygon. Okay? So this point should not be allowed in the configuration space, the mapping of, if you, if you map this polygon to its configuration space, we also include this point in the forbidden space. Because this point, this configuration is forbidden. Okay, so because the, the polygonal robot, which is large, uh, so uh, enlarges this polygon, 
when it's mapped to the configuration space. So this is where we are going to use the Minkowski sums to compute this uh, C obstacle. But right now, uh, if we have a point robot, uh, this polygon is exactly mapped to the uh, configuration uh, space as, a, as an obstacle. I mean, if, if our robot was even larger, uh, I mean, th this depends really on the size of your robot, how much you are going to enlarge your original polygon. Right now, let's just uh, delay this problem and let's just think about the point robot and uh, the mapping of a polygon to the configuration space. We are going to uh, denote them the configuration space obstacle as C obstacle. We are going to denote them as C obstacle and the uh, the polygon, when it's mapped to the configuration space, we are going to just say it's a configuration space obstacle, like with CP. Okay, we are going to denote them uh, with this term CP to distinguish between the actual obstacle and the part, the polygon in the, uh, the, the obstacle in the configuration space. Now, for a point robot, it's really simple. Uh, the free configuration space, so the, the x, y values that I can legally go to, okay, so these are the, the, my free configuration space of a robot are the x, y values that you can uh, go to, you can, you can translate to, is given simply by the difference of this bounding box, okay, so this is your bounding box, uh, the, this is the bounding box, uh, the difference of this bounding box from the union of these uh, polygons is your free. I mean, this, this area, which is obviously uh, the, uh, the difference of this polygon from these obstacles, is going to be your free configuration space. Now, this, uh, we don't restrict our polygons uh, to be simple polygons, actually. They can actually have holes inside them, okay? A polygon may have holes inside them. In that case, this part is going also going to be free, okay? So this is, I'm, although it's impossible to go inside that obstacle, but it's also a place that, I mean, if our, maybe there may be another, uh, if we, not a translational robot, but uh, I mean, transporting robot. <laughs> so we can just tra I mean, transport directly to that uh, place. Uh, a jumping point, yeah, maybe jumping robot. Uh, it could jump, yeah, maybe. That's another thing. That's another degree of freedom. <laughs> and we could, we could go find ourselves inside this obstacle. So what's the use? But there may be a goal there, okay? A cat may be trapped. <laughs> you just want the robot. This may be your goal position, maybe inside a polygon. So now, but I mean, th these are not really critical, but our algorithm is going to be able to handle that. Now, here, this uh, configuration space, uh, the, the free configuration space. Now, uh, how can we represent this free space in order to help us to find a path for this point robot? One, one choice, there, there may be, this is not the only cho choice, okay? There may be alternative solution to solve this path finding problem. But uh, we can make use of what we have learned in this class. Okay, like the trapezoidal maps. Okay, the trapezoidal map is going to be, so we, we can, uh, we have seen the point location problem. Uh, we had a subdivision and we, uh, we divided uh, these into, we divided the regions into trapezoids, which allowed us to locate a point, for example, in log n time. Okay, so given where, where is this point in this, it was a good data structures to perform searches. And the trapezoidal was, map was represented as a doubly connected edge list. So you can also move from face to face. Move from, uh, if you're in a face, you can go to the neighboring face. So it will allow you to uh, traverse uh, the space, okay? If you represent this uh, free space by a trapezoidal map, it's maybe a good idea, uh, I mean, to do that. And it's going to, um, we can then define a road map that goes uh, from uh, that traverses this trapezoidal map. So uh, we need uh, such a data structure and this is what we do. Uh, we call this trapezoidal map of the free space C3, okay. So we, we build 
a trapezoidal map, and we have seen that we, have, we, we can build a trapezoidal map in n log n time if uh, are the number of uh, the if the complexity of our is of our subdivision is n uh, we can compute the trapezoidal map in n log n time uh, we have seen it in the previous weeks so uh, this is what we do and the thing is uh, after we compute this trapezoidal map if you remember in the trapezoidal map what we do is we have vertical extensions uh, from each endpoints okay so we have for from each endpoint uh, we have vertical extension even here so this becomes okay so a trapezoidal map so I just draw part of it but uh, after we have this trapezoidal map what we see is that the trapezoids inside obstacles are unnecessary because we're not never going to go inside an obstacle so our, because anyway this part is not part of our free space okay this polygon is not is a, is a hole is a hole in our free space so this hole which doesn't belong to the free space should not be represented uh, in our there's there shouldn't be any face that represent this polygon in our free space so our free space should only consist of parts faces that are here that the robot can move so what we do is we first uh, build a trapezoidal map for all the polygons here, including everything. Then we uh, all the trapezoids that are uh, inside the inside the obstacle are removed from this doubly connected edge list. So we can uh, the algorithm is really simple. This is the algorithm uh, in page 271 of your second edition uh, textbook. Uh, which is we just compute the trapezoidal map and we remove the trapezoids that lie inside one of the uh, polygons from the obstacles okay so we return the resulting subdivision uh, let me uh, draw, uh, draw this figure I, mean, I can I can have yeah let me have the trapezoidal map for this one here or what we have here. Okay, from each endpoint, let me have it with the red pen. And so this is our forbidden space. And this is the complete trapezoidal map for this free space. Okay, for the free space, uh, I have this trapezoidal map. As you can see, I don't need to draw any trapezoids within the, I don't need to do the extensions uh, that goes inside these uh, polygons. Okay, and this can be done in n log n time. And here, now I'm going to define so how, how are we going to use this data structure uh, to find a path from an arbitrary uh, start position to an arbitrary goal position okay so uh, here is how we construct a roadmap uh, the roadmap so path finding is really good if you have some kind of a graph representation of your um, I mean we, we know pathfinding in, in graphs like the shortest path algorithm the even the, the, the finding a path between two nodes 
uh, if we could represent this roadmap, I mean, because still here, the points inside these trapezoids, there are infinitely many points, okay? So there are infinitely many points within these trapezoids. So we need to somehow discretize this, uh, make our solution space. We need to, we are trying to find a solution in a finite amount of possible movement places. So what we do is, but with the, but with, with after having this trapezoidal map, we uh, construct ourselves a road map as a graph. And here is what, how we do it. We place a node at the center of each trapezoid. Okay, so the idea, I mean, the, the general idea is going to be, we are going to be moving from trapezoid to trapezoid until we get to the trapezoid of this goal. So first, first of all, in log n time, we can find the trapezoids of the start position and goal position, so which trapezoids they exist in by using the techniques we have seen. In log n time, we can locate these points, which trapezoids they are in. So the, the, then the, uh, the t our uh, problem will be to find a list of trapezoids to move that is going to take us from the tra trapezoid of this one and to this one. The good thing about trapezoids is that they are, uh, the, all these are convex. So if you're in a trapezoid, you can move anywhere within that trapezoid freely. Okay, so that's the, that's the main thing. For example, uh, we are going to see uh, how we are going to find the path. So first, let's talk about the roadmap. So at the center of each trapezoid, we place a node in this roadmap graph. And these nodes are not enough, okay? We may be, for example, unable to directly connect, uh, yeah, for example, this, this, look at this example, this node here cannot, we cannot directly go from this node to the center of the other trapezoid, although these trapezoids are neighbors, okay? So we solve this problem by adding extra nodes at the midpoint of each vertical extension, okay? So for each vertical extension, we add another node at their uh, midpoints. So we have nodes at the center of trapezoids and we have nodes at the uh, vertical extensions at the midpoints of these vertical extensions. And these vertical extensions are going to guarantee, I mean these nodes at the vertical extensions is going to guarantee us that, I mean since these are all convex, there's a path which is, uh, which doesn't collide with any obstacle. From a center of a trapezoid, we can either move uh, to this node or to this node, I mean these these uh, paths, these lines, can be drawn safely because it's, uh, uh, these vertical extensions are part of uh, this trapezoid. Okay, so uh, we are going to, our roadmap is going to, uh, we are going to put edges uh, from the center uh, of this uh, trapezoid to the midpoints in their uh, edges. Okay, for example, this one, this node here is going to so this trapezoid here is going to have this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge. Okay, so it can at most have four uh, such vertical extensions. Yes. Exactly. I mean, this is just arbitrary. <laughs> I mean, it's because our, uh, uh, I mean, you could choose any point on that vertical extension, but right now you don't know whether choosing the uh, leftmost or the upmost, uh, you don't know which one is better actually. You have no idea without doing ex an additional analysis. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to be a shortest path because uh, we don't know where our goal is. Okay, without knowing your goal and without whether maybe after these, what you suggest is something greedy. Okay, just first go to uh, here, but from here you may need to take a path that that needs to go over, over an obstacle here. So there may not be a path uh, in this region. So you may, maybe choosing the upper point may prove to be better based on the next obstacle, based on the position of the next obstacle. So we are going to see how we can find shortest paths uh, next week. But this week, our goal is just to find any path. Okay, find any path that is going to uh, work for us. So therefore, these are just these vertical, the midpoints are just 
uh, arbitrary. It may, I mean, it's just a choice. It, it could be any point on the. That's that's the, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, we can improve this algorithm actually. I mean, this this algorithm can be improved. Maybe if we have some ideas, if we see the structure of this graph, maybe the structure of the graph, uh, you can post-process it to uh, change the position of the points after you see the whole graph by looking at the topology you may see okay since I already see this trapezoid directly maybe why not put let's just move these points in different places it can be done in what you say can be done in the post-processing space so it's uh, improvements to this algorithm is possible now after we have this roadmap, actually the final solution is really easy. If you uh, have this, this, this roadmap is going to guarantee you that by jumping from uh, neighboring nodes, so since you have edges, you have a graph, uh, nodes connected with edges, by traversing these nodes, following these edges, you can go to any trapezoid in this graph. So you have the start trapezoid, goal trapezoid, by using Actually, you have these nodes, okay? You, you know this node, you, this is the uh, node with which the goal, goal lies in, goal, uh, goal is in this trapezoid, and this is the node in which star is in. So our pathfinding algorithm is consisting of three stages. The first stage is get from start to the middle node of this trapezoid, which is guaranteed to have a linear path you can I mean these are the very, this is very trivial so what the the three stages I'm telling here is really trivial the first stage get start from this node is a very trivial thing and the final stage after when you end up end up at this node go from this node to the gold node these two first and third stages are very trivial stages like move within the trapezoid and the middle stage is to find a path that connects this node to this node which can be done by using breadth first search, okay? Or just find the shortest. You can use even the uh, Kruskal's algorithm or other. You can use, uh, not Kruskal. I mean, you can, Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, for example, can be used. At, you can find the shortest path, and shortest path is also breadth first search, okay? So you can, uh, you can use any path finding algorithm on graphs to find, to connect this node to this node. So the algorithm then finds the path, for example, for this one, Let's see a pattern. Since we are not dealing with shortest paths here, uh, this breadth first search can have alternative solutions. Okay, so this, for example, is a possible solution. Something like this. Oops, the mid, we have mid, mid point is here, then go here. <laughs> As you can see, we do many unnecessary zigzags, okay? Even the goal was here. We first uh, go from this midpoint to the center of this trapezoid first, then go here. I mean, uh, actually, in the final, actually, this final step is unnecessary. When you reach the vertical extension here, you can directly go. You don't need to go to the center, okay? So this is unnecessary. It's guaranteed. If you reach a neighbor, a vertical extension, uh, which is adjacent to the final trapezoid, you can directly move to your goal. Okay, so one step shorter. So this is our path finding algorithm for, uh, this is what we are going to do. If we have the free space, we build a trapezoidal map of the free space, and we build a road map on this, and we use breadth for search to find uh, the connecting uh, nodes in this uh, free space. Now, the next is, after the break, we are going to talk about how we can solve uh, this for polygonal robots. Not point robots, but if we have a polygon robot, what's, what are we going to do? And the solution is going to be simple. We are going to compute, again, a free space, this time by enlarging these polygons uh, with the Minkowski sums. Okay, so this is the solution I'm going to talk about next after the break.